87th Precinct Podcast Christmas Party Episode. Welcome to our fabulous festive McBain Bonanza. McBonanza. Yes, we're inviting you into the Hark Podcast Office Party. Steve-O is just over there shaking the crackers to try and work out which one has the miniature screwdriver set in it. Shake, shake. And Morgan has eaten a whole bowl of tinsel. <laughs> so, yes, that'll come back to haunt him. It really will. As for me, Paul, I'm dressed as a reindeer. That's not because of the party. That's just a coincidence. So, hello to you two. Hello. Hello there. Season's greetings. All that, yeah. Yes, indeed. And merry happy to all our listeners and everyone who's stuck with us throughout these past few years. This may be our last December episode. Oh, my Lord. So, if the, if the schedule is to be believed. Oh God. Why, how many more books we got? Well, we've just done book 42, haven't we? But we're doing this one, which is another one, which will take us... Yeah, so 43 out of 55. We might be here. We might get through more. We don't know. We don't know. Oh, God. So we'll see. But yeah, we are actually bringing you one of the official 87th Precinct books today. Sort of out of sequence, but like I say, it's possibly the last December we're going to do this. So we didn't want to leave it any longer. It is the very short story, And All Through the House. And I'll go through all the dates and facts and figures to explain why we're doing it out of sequence and why we can do it out of sequence as we get stuck into it. But to kick things off, I've got a couple of questions for us to tackle. All right, okay. So first up, we've got a Christmassy question from our pal Matthew Sullivan on Twitter, who asks, if the boys and girls from the 8-7 were Santa's reindeers and other Christmas characters, (laughs) e.g. the Grinch or the Little Drummer Boy, who would be who in McBain Christmas world? Hmm. Lord. You have to choose what sort of Christmas characters you'd you'd have, wouldn't you? Yeah, would would hmm. Pete Burns be Father Christmas, do we think? Yeah. <laughs> dishes out the work, a bit like uh, Oh yeah, I suppose. A bit like Father Christmas, dishes out presents. Doesn't have a beard though. No, true. Uh, I mean, would Andy Parker be the Grinch? Yeah, I think that's that's an easy If one, anyone's isn't going it? to be, it's gonna be Andy Parker, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Fat Ollie would okay. be that lunatic relative who only turns up every now and then, i.e. at Christmas, uh, yeah. and is both <laughs> amusing and highly annoying in generally equal measures. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I keep thinking about who, what other Christmas characters there are, but all I can think about is Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, and I don't think that's officially part of Christmas canon <laughs> in the broader sense. Nope. Sad times. Who guides the sleigh? I mean, does this make... Like Corella, Rudolph, <laughs> like the guiding light of the department. Yeah. Well, but uh, unless unless Cotton Hawes is, is Rudolph the, the red-haired reindeer. Ah, very good, very good. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I feel that uh, Maya Maya might not get a character just by uh, religious default, sadly. Well, possibly. Yes, if some sort of... Hanukkah character instead, maybe. Monaghan and Moreau could be um, Eric Morecambe and Ernie Wise, couldn't they? Or the two (laughs) Ronnies, i.e. comedy double act that only spring up at Christmas, generally speaking. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I think that would be good. That would be appropriate. Who would be the three wise men in the world of the 87th precinct? Well, not none of them are... Well, all of them prone to lapses of wiseness, aren't they? Well, Sam Grossman, he could be one of them, couldn't he? Yeah, Sam he could, Grossman yeah. Is, is possibly the wisest of men. And Blaney, the, uh, what's his name? Carl or Paul Blaney. Yeah. Uh, depending on who's on duty. And <laughs> uh, we'd need a third one. I think if you could a third one, you can have someone like, uh, I don't know. Uh, another techie person. What about Annie Rawls? Kind of a wise, like that, a wise yeah. woman. Yeah. <laughs> I think that would work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think the truth is it's quite hard to fit the complex characters of the world of the 87th Precinct into the uh, powerful but simple ideas that are conveyed in Christmas stories. But we've had a little try there. We, we have indeed. Yeah, yeah, we've kind of mixed and matched a bit, a lot. Yeah. 
But uh, let yeah. us know. Let us know what you think. It'll be weird if you tell us this any time after Christmas. But, <laughs> yeah. but I've got one another question, which is not a Christmassy one, but this is from uh, one of our Twitter followers again, someone who's based in Hyderabad in India. Ooh, in fact, cool. how exciting! Which is uh, a chap called Fani Kanuri who asks. Do you think Steve Carella was based on the great man Ed McBain himself? Which is something we've talked about before, but I think perhaps because we're so many books into the series now and so many years in, is Carella still really McBain, do we think, at this point? He always is to some extent, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he, he, yeah. he's undoubtedly physically him, and I think he is probably what Ed McBain aspires to be, isn't he? <laughs> yes, yeah. He's kind um, of Ed McBain's better self. I, I, I think I, I, we've, we've sort of said that each of the characters – reflects some traits of, of McBain, don't they? I think yeah. possibly. Yeah. It's more of a gestalt sort of thing for the, the force to become McBain. Uh, you know, I think even the deaf man might have aspects of McBain in him yeah, as well in, in certain ways, which is, I don't know, that might be a controversial thing to say, I don't know, but Corella's clearly the avatar for, like you say, the idealised McBain, and I don't think that's changed all the way through. Hmm. And perhaps even when he's talking about, oh, the years and time passing, which we always treat as a joke about the time in the books. But that's probably McBain as well saying, I can't believe I've been doing this for for this long. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, because yeah, he probably writes one feeling as it's still fairly fresh and then he thinks, crikey, I've been doing it for 30-odd years or however long it is by this point, 35 yeah. years. Yeah, a bit of him. I'm no author, but I suppose when you write something, there's a little bit of you in every character, wouldn't there be, to a certain greater or lesser extent? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, well, uh, uh, obviously a sad loss to uh, the world of literature recently was John le Carre, who passed away. Oh, yes, that was very sad, yeah. And of course, without his background that he came from and him being the person he was, we wouldn't have had the characters he created, you know. no. Because it's not just experience, it's personality as well, isn't it, that sort of Absolutely. imbues those books? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, no, I think there's a, a, a reasonable chunk of McBain. But I think he's he's certainly, you know, like all the other characters of, well, maybe not Maya Maya, but most of the others have got fairly certain character flaws, haven't they? Corella seems to lack any immediate flaw, doesn't he? He's, yeah. more, he's more of an idealised character, isn't he, than any of the others. One of the things I do know about McBain's personality, as told to us by Otto Penslow when I interviewed him, was you know he, they, he liked to laugh. So a lot of these yeah. squad room scenes where people are telling dirty jokes <laughs> and and the group is laughing, that's McBain as well. In an ex yeah. sort of you know in that experience of those scenes, that's definitely what it would be like sitting around having a drink with him in a, a meal or something like that. Yeah. I get the impression. Yeah. Uh, there we go. I think you're right. Embues the whole thing with his his personality and presence, which is one of the reasons we keep reading them. Absolutely. And, well, final question. This is a question from me to you guys, which is, what do you reckon your favourite Christmas present ever was? Oh, my God. God. Oh, that's a tough one. Or one that sticks out in your mind. (laughs) Nothing particularly. I I, I don't think... I would think... Seem to get stuff for me birthday rather than Christmas. I would think. I don't know. I generally can't really think of anything. <laughs> I'm quite the opposite. I've got too many things that I can think of that that I want to choose from. Realistically, probably the best Christmas present ever was uh, my Epiphone SG a guitar that I, I did get given for Christmas. I, I think when I was about twenty, which was a ridiculous prezi, but. There's definitely plenty from childhood that stand out, which at the time were just as exciting, I'm sure. Um, definitely one one year got a board game, which was called something like Tank Command, which at the yeah. time I thought was the most amazing thing. It was like um, a minefield with like little plastic tanks. It's basically just battleships, I think. But if if you landed on the wrong square, there was you could press a button and and the the little tank kind of popped up like it hit a mine. It's very impressive. <laughs> Sounds very thrilling. Oh, it was. My answer is 
funnily enough, it's not a Transformer. Well, I did get trans- Transformers for Christmas, but the best Transformer I got, which was Optimus Prime, I got for my birthday. Uh-huh. But what it is, is the Thunder Tank from Thundercats. Wow. Which, so that must that. have been 1985 or 86. And I wasn't expecting it because that's quite a big present, really. Uh-huh. Yeah, I remember getting that and being like, what? The Thunder Tank. So that's my abiding memory of like a really good toy yeah. present that was like oh, that's wow. a great one with its pop-up <laughs> arms and all that sort of stuff oh, yeah steve has no favorite presents well i, I don't know perhaps I, I do i still think my memory is as good as other people's because i honestly can't really remember i remember you used to get stuff like lego and stuff for... always a good year if you got lego yeah, yeah but yeah i can't honestly think oh i remember the year when i got X, Y, or Z, really, unfortunately. So I'm very unhelpful for that piece, I'm afraid. It's much less materialistic than me. Yeah, yeah. if you think of something, Steve-O, partway through the tempo, just just say it out loud, you know, <laughs> just out of context at some point, you just go, <laughs> a board game! See, I, I can remember getting all, all manner of great stuff, but I, I cannot remember specifically when. Um, um, that's fair enough. See all my all my exciting railway stuff that I've got, and yet I I couldn't tell you whether I got that for my birthday or Christmas. Remember getting the A team van and be, finding Ooh. that absolutely amazing. But That's again, that could quite easily be my birthday and not Christmas. So well, who knows? We'll claim it for Christmas as your answer then. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Okay. Let's get stuck into this this book because I have got quite a lot of facts and figures for a book hmm. that is literally what? How many pages? I don't forty know. pages is it with yeah. illustrations? Yeah, it's in the illustrated that. version, it's forty pages long. It's got some interesting facts and figures I can give you here. So, the reason we can do it out of sequence is because there's nothing in. Well, there's one thing in there that ties it to the sequence of stories. Other than that, it could sit at any point beyond this thing Mm -hmm. it originally appears in an issue of playboy magazine in december of 1984 with illustrations by someone called chris van alsberg not as many illustrations as end up in the one most people will know i've got the cover of playboy magazine in front of me here i haven't actually got the magazine i've got the cover Mm -hmm. that i found it's their gala christmas issue with uh, interesting articles such as undies for the 80s fantastic (laughs) Something about Mario Puzo bringing back Michael Corleone. Yeah, something about Ronald, young Ronald Reagan. Oh, God. And then lots of stories. And Suzanne Summers' all new pictorial reveals all. Oh, and a Paul and Linda McCartney interview as well. It's uh, got a very 80s cover on it. But it, <laughs> it does bring us this story anyway. And as we know, Playboy did publish quite a lot of McBain stuff. But okay. also, in 1984, we then get, following up, the Book Club Edition, Book Club Edition 10429, published by Doubleday, which acknowledges that it originally appeared in Playboy magazine, which doesn't have any illustrations in it, and so is only 32 pages, which we were kindly gifted at the podcast by one of our listeners a couple of years ago, Stella. So thank you very much. So I've got that to hand for reference. Then there's a big gap, and then the one that most people will remember, and the one that I have put as the official place in the chart is... The Warner Books Illustrated Edition, which is the one I assume we've all got. Indeed. The blue one. Yeah, yeah, the blue one. And that appears in November of 1994, and I've officially named it book number 46. Mm. So this is why we're sort of, we're kind of jumping ahead, but also making up for lost time in a way, because it's 84, <laughs> 94. What are Warner Books involved for? I think there is a publisher at the time. Oh, were they? All right. By this point, because I think we get a couple more publisher shifts. In, oh, well, I think we get lots more in the next few years anyway. Ah, oh, right. Got, got you. <laughs> yeah. It's illustrated by Victor Juhas. I don't know how you pronounce that. J-U-H-A-S-Z. I don't think that was too bad. A uh, book designed by Julia Kushnirsky. Both of those still working, I think, in various aspects of book design and illustration. And so, yeah, you might you might have the copy in Playboy. You might have the 1984 book club edition. You're more likely to have the 1994 edition that was sold to the wider public. That's that. No, no UK edition then, presumably. No, no. Oh, wow. And actually, while I didn't have much of a difficult time getting hold of a copy myself, I did look the other day on eBay in the UK, and actually, there's no copies of it up <laughs> being sold oh, wow. in in England or, or United Ooh. Kingdom at the moment. Could sell it for vast 
profit. Yeah. Has yours got a sheath? Yes, yes, it does have a cardboard Box. sheath on it. Mm. Oh, mine doesn't. Um, oh. I did have to get mine from from America, actually, uh, in order to, to have a copy for this. Um, uh, there weren't any on sale from, from UK sales at the time. Yeah, it's got like a window, Morgan, that you put it inside, yeah. like a cardboard box. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. There's been one adaptation of this, and that was on the 25th of December, 2016. A program called Stiller Nacht went out on German radio, and it was a German radio adaptation of this book. <laughs> uh, it's curious. Yeah, it is. It, it was adapted by Chris Findlay and directed by someone called Mark Ginsler. So that would be, I mean, I'd like to listen to that, although obviously yeah. I don't speak German, but it would be interesting to know that 2016, that was, that was done. That's so. pretty cool. Shall we, shall we do a little bit of Christmas context before we get stuck into the, yeah, the content of the not? book? So Im- imagine it's 1984 and it's December, 1984 around Christmas time, the films in the cinema that we've got, the highest grossing film of 1984. Ghostbusters. No, no. It was Beverly Hills Cop. Oof. Not Beverly Hills Copy, as I've just noticed, uh, is typed on my little notes here. That's uh, <laughs> a whole different story. <laughs> Another film that was in the cinemas in December 1984 was June. Oh, yeah. Marvellous. Not a very Christmassy movie, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't <laughs> no, say. <that. laughs> not many jingle bells in that. But we've also got A Passage to India, which is one of those big sweeping epics that used to turn up on bank holidays, wasn't it, on TV? Yeah. yeah. Name of okay. many a restaurant. Indeed. Yeah, was that, was that early, earliest Merchant Ivory, possibly even, a passage to India? Yeah, yeah, pr- pr- probably was, actually. So those were some of the, the big films in cinemas in 1984 when the original story came out. But we got uh, I've got the top three in UK music and US music. Mm. I mean, you guys might be able to guess what was number one over Christmas in 1984. Uh, do they know it's um, Christmas? Yeah. Yes, that was number one. <laughs> you might be able to guess what was number two as well. Yeah, I remember even a Christmas gift. I got me, I got me uh, Donald Wears Your Trousers uh, for, for Christmas, <laughs> definitely. I yeah, remember we, that, yeah. Oh, there we go. One. As mentioned on the previous <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Another massive Christmas song is at number two anyway, that people try not to hear for some bizarre game reason at the moment. Oh, uh, Wham. Yeah, Last yeah. Christmas. Yeah, that's been going on a few years, that, hasn't it? Whamageddon, yeah. Yeah, you've got to see how far in December you can get without hearing it. <laughs> yeah. And at number three is We All Stand Together by Paul McCartney and the Frog Chorus. Fantastic. Oh, God, God I've, I've guessed that for loads of answers in the past as well, haven't I? <laughs> Uh, and uh, top three in the US well I'm not going to make you guess number one is Like a Virgin by Madonna very festive number two is The Wild Boys by Duran Duran oh yeah and and then I've stopped re- listing things there because there's no Christmas songs in the top of the charts at all in America oh, bit, oh. Of, bit of a shame if it was 1994 I wonder what you'd soon see at the cinema any idea at all 1994 what, um so let me have a think. <laughs> what came out in 1994? I don't know. I, I, don't, I certainly don't know about what would have been out at Christmas. Um, Pulp Fiction was 1994. Uh, the Lion King, maybe. There are a couple of Christmas films. And so you've got The Santa Claus. Oh, yeah. And you've also got the re, the John Hughes produced remake of Miracle on 34th Street. Oh, God. But you've also got Dumb and Dumber and Street Fighter the movie. Yeah, <laughs> Street Fighter the movie, well. All the greats. Not cinema's finest year, I don't think. It's funny, isn't it? Like, some years you can think of loads of stuff, and then others. Now well, It might be our age as well, really. Yeah, well, yeah, I suppose. But, I'll, uh, yeah, so I've got the, the top two songs in the UK were Stay Another Day by East 17. Oh, God. Some marvellous uh, outfits in that video for that. Is, yeah. <laughs> stood the test of time, actually. And number two, talking about songs that have stood the test of time, All I Want for Christmas is You by Mariah Carey. Oh, oh yeah, blimey, well, yeah. That definitely has, yeah. It finally, finally got, went to number one this year, I think. Not at Christmas number one, but yeah, actually, 
did hit the, the top spot at some point. It certainly has. And um, that's partly the changing nature of how people buy music now Very with true. streaming and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's, I think it's a deserved number one. And it's But at this point in 1994, it gets to number two. I think that's the highest it ever got. Hmm. So, well, I know it was until last week or whatever. <laughs> and in America, we've got at number one, On Bended Knee by Boys to Men. Ugh. Doesn't sound Christmassy. No, it'll it just sounds drippy, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. And at number two, we've got Here Comes the Hot Stepper by Inni Kamosi. Inni Kamosi. Yeah. Yeah, a stormer. Not very Christmassy though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then my note is, as before, no Christmas songs. So clearly, Christmas songs not a massive tradition over over there across the pond. No. Okay. I think they are a bit more so in the UK, aren't they? Due to yeah, the definitely. immense amount of them churned out in the 1970s kind of started a bit of a market for them, didn't they? Yeah, that was definitely the, the, the sort of initial heyday of them, wasn't it? Yeah. Slade and what have you, Wizard. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that has kind of always enticed bands over here to like have a stab at them, don't they? Yeah, yeah, if you can, if you can knock out a song that gets dragged out for, for a few weeks every single year, that's got to be a good kind of thing to have, sort of um, to to keep the funds rolling in. Yeah, get get your PRS uh, money you know, in the next quarter yeah. after that. You know, and one once in every ten years, uh, good old Cliff's got dibs on as well. So you'll need <laughs> nine more for, yeah, per decade, don't you? <laughs> Right. Okay. Well, let's get stuck into this book then, shall we? And yeah, the first thing to say, obviously, it's an illustrated book, which is the only example of a, an official book thing with a, with the characters illustrated. So McBain must have looked at these and said, oh, yeah, they're fine. They look like the characters look, hmm. I assume. Yeah. You know, this is perhaps the most official um, images of the 87th Precinct we've got. Yeah. And we open with a dedication. Can either of you two tell me who this book is dedicated to? It's really hard to work out. This is for my grandchildren, Dean and Susan Hunter Catrona. Yeah. Here we go. Didn't need to do much research for that one. No, no. we didn't. No. <laughs> no. Uh, there's his um, grandchildren to his son, Richard Hunter, I believe. So how old so. were they in 1984? Do we know that? Well... That dedication is only in the 1994 edition. There's oh, no dedication yeah. in the 84 one. Oh. He didn't open his Playboy <laughs> article with, I'm dedicating <laughs> this to my grandchildren. Oh, Fair well, enough. no, I suppose not. No. <laughs> oh, so perhaps that, perhaps that was maybe slightly prompted him doing something with it again, maybe, if they were at such an age. Let's have some initial thoughts. I mean, I'll, t- well, I'll tell you what my initial thought is. And if you cast your back, you cast your backs. <laughs> I'll cast me back, yep. yeah. Well... Perhaps you cast your back. We'll also cast our minds back to last year when we did our Christmas special, which was watching an episode of Barney Miller, if you recall Uh, that, which was all set in the squad room of the Barney Miller police station. It was a Christmas-themed episode. And this really reminds me of it. So, And all through the house really reminds me. It's just all in one place. A series of people come in to the room. Stuff happens. It's Christmas stuff. I think there's a, a, a definite Barney Miller vibe to this book. There really yeah. is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, with the, there's a slight, and a, now this is going to sound stupid because I actually have read it before, but there is a very slight, I definitely know that I have read this before, book vibe to it, isn't there, if you, if you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I think I get it. I mean, it's, it's a squad room scene, just extended a bit larger, isn't it? So huh. it, it's got that familiarity to it anyway. But, um, but he sets a nice nativity scene up, basically, doesn't he, over a fairly short, well, very short story. It's, and like, There's not masses to say here. I mean, it's quite easy to sum up the plot. Corella's in the, in the squad room on his own, and the other detectives all come back bringing various people they've had to arrest, whether it's some people who are fighting over a bag of marijuana, or it's a couple who have been squatting somewhere because they've not been able to make their contact in the country. They're from Puerto Rico. She's pregnant as a kid with a sheep, you know, of course. <laughs> and there's also this enigmatic guy that uh, Bert Kling brings in who doesn't say anything until the very end. <laughs> you know, we get a little nod on the phone to Dave Murchison. We've got Alf Miskolo coming in 
as well, getting taunted for his bad coffee. <laughs> uh, you know, Andy Parker's there just to complete the cheer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So did you spot how we know that it is, uh, we can place it somewhere potentially in the, uh, in the canon of the books? Is it the reference to Miss Golo delivering a, is it Miss Golo delivering a baby? Is that what I'm yeah. thinking of? Yeah. Yeah, it is. So in ICE, they have the thing where someone gives birth in the squad room mm-hmm. and that's the only thing that's referred in here. So we know it has to be after ICE. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, originally it was published about the time that Lightning was published. So you've got ICE in 1983, you've got Lightning in 1984. And then the 1994 edition was published between Mischief and, and Romance. Hmm. It doesn't matter as long as it's after ICE if people are keeping track. <laughs> this is the main thing. Hmm. I love it. I just think it's, it's, it's a great story. Yeah, it's, it's cracking, isn't it? It's also quite nice to read it in the midst of the ones we've been doing recently, which have all been very dark and, and dramatic and violent and dirty as well. To have something that's, I don't know, it's a bit hard to say pure when it is all still based on people committing crimes oh. or being accused of, of doing something wrong. But I don't know. It's, it's got the vibe right, I reckon. Yeah, there's a very Definitely. light-heartedness to it, isn't there? Uh, and a good dose of ridiculousness as well. The, the sheep uh, being a good example. Yes. Uh, the fact that Corella's constantly being on the phone again. Corella's nemesis is the telephone, <laughs> I'm sure. He, he, Cotton Horse comes in covered in blood and, and he's like, well, I'll, ring, I'll ring up for the hospital. He's like, don't ring the hospital. He's like, I've got to do it. Someone else comes in with a pregnant I've got to ring the hospital. I just keep doing it. So Corella tied to the phone as he very often is when he's in the squad room. What do you reckon on the illustrations then? Yeah, they, 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 they're quite good, aren't they? It's funny how it makes a, a kind of a big difference, really. Being a big fan of like all the old Sherlock Holmes short stories, and they were always illustrated, weren't they, with like little pen uh, images, so that they were they were quite nice. Yeah, sort of freehand sketching style rather than yeah. finished painted portraits or yeah, anything like I that. Think, I think, obviously, there's a, a great character caricatureness to the the characters but the squad room seems very faithful doesn't it to the description with the filing cabinets and the um, slatter dividing wall etc and the, uh, the the little detention cell as well yes. all all appearing so um yeah no they, they're good they're quite little quite neat i think yeah, it's also, I'm sure, the only book I own where you have an aerial view of a woman giving birth or part of a woman giving birth from behind some filing cabinets. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think that's in any other book I own. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I, no, I really like the, the style of them. And I, I do like sort of the framing of, of some of the, the scenes as well. It is, it is nicely done. And yeah, I think the, the depictions of, of most of the characters tie in fairly well with what I've imagined from, from the descriptions we've been given as well. Uh, and as you say, the style's kind of sketchy enough that it's not so minutely detailed that you're, it, it, it leaves them kind of vague enough that, that they're close enough to what you've imagined, I think, which is, is pretty cool. Yeah. Ex- yeah, it does, it does a good job as well, sort of capturing... Uh, when, it, when it is dynamic, like when you've got Hawes pushing the, the two guys through the, the railings, that's quite a dynamic thing, which is captured quite easily because of the sketchy nature of it. Yeah. And but then when it's still and it's just a scene altogether, that that works really well. I really do like that. I mean, on that subject, of that question we were asked about is McBain Corella. That very first picture of Corella sat <laughs> his typewriter. I mean, that could be McBain. Yeah, it yeah, really could. yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a very sweet thing. I think. Yeah, like you say, it ends in this sort of <laughs> this default nativity scene where there's certain things taking the place of gold frankincense and myrrh <laughs> such as marijuana and stolen jewels yeah it's funny how there's not three of them because they'd be like the three kings wouldn't they those guys or um... well, i guess the uh the guy cling brings in is is the third is he oh well trust me i suppose so yeah there's only w- only one shepherd i suppose yeah well that's one more than you'd expect to find in the middle of a city <laughs> that's true I enjoy the kid with the sheep as well. They just can't understand why there's any problem with him just taking a sheep from from a, a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that Miss Golo, Miss Golo doesn't know that it's not a deer. <laughs> that's that's an interesting character character trait that he doesn't know what a sheep is. <laughs> I'd like it if that became a running thing that goes on through the rest of the books. Now that would be great. <laughs> 
yeah, good Christmas quiz question though is what was the name of the three wise men in the Bible? Can you remember? Uh, is there there's uh, Melchior is one of them? Melchior is one. I know you uh, put in about the ridiculous answers in the uh, pub <laughs> quiz that time, which uh, yes, I'm fairly sure I was there for that as well. <laughs> Bal Balsavar or something like that. Balthazar, yeah, yeah, Balthazar, Melchior, and um, the one named after a friendly ghost. Oh, Casper. Casper. Yeah. Yeah, Casper, <laughs> Balthazar, Melchior. Not as one of my students did in a quiz that I ran when I was a teacher at Christmas. <laughs> Most of the students didn't guess anything at all for the name of the three wise men. And they would have all have gone to probably Catholic schools, these students. But one hmm. person did have a stab at it. And so the closest answer was Berta, Sinitas, and Quaresmo. <laughs> <laughs> Practically the same. <laughs> Which I will never forget as long as I live. Quaresmo. Quaresmo is a brilliant life. It's a lot. I mean, he was still the closest answerer in the class. So. Oh, dear. Uh, partial credit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, indeed. Right. Okay, then. Well, we're not going to drag this out much longer because, like I say, it's a very short book, but it's a very sweet book and everyone should make yeah. a point of getting it. You know, like Definitely. I say, I'm counting it as an official story in, in in the run of books, which makes it 55 rather than 54 87th Precinct books. So we'll sum up in a second. I think we should apply a score. We should give it a Kenneth score. Yeah, we'll sum up. And I've found one reference to it in a newspaper, like a review of this issue this 1994 issue and then i'll I'll tell you what that is after we've done our summing up so i'll go first and i'm going to quite simply say it's a lovely little thing it's a quick read i mean a very very quick read it is a nice relief like i say (laughs) when you're reading it about the time that it comes out in 1994 in, in the run of the books that come up to that anyway and so i'm quite happy to give this i would say a solid 80 police shields and I'll ask Morgan what he thinks. Fantastic! Yeah, well, I, I quite agree. It's a, it's a it's a, a lovely little story. It's it's a lovely just item as well as a as a book. I'm delighted yes. to uh, to own it. My my particular copy is a, an ex library one from the Newtown Public Library, Newtown, Pennsylvania. Ooh, oh, super! How, how exciting! It's a pretty fun little thing. Um, yeah, I love it. Uh, I, I was, I found it really charming. Uh, I think it's going to become a regular part of my kind of Christmas ritual, kind of digging it out and giving it another read. Cool. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit higher and go 85 police shields. Okie dokie. So, steve Yes, well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't think you can have any complaints about this. A nice little entry. And, um, yeah, it's always good to have, like, a little anomaly in a, a series of books, isn't it, where it's something totally different. So, um, yeah, yeah I, think, I think I've got 80 police shields. I think, um, yes, that, that would sum up uh, quite nicely, I think. Okie dokie. And that gives it a... a Kenneth total of 81.6666666, but because it's Christmas, I'm rounding it up to 82. Oh, amazing. I had to reprogram Kenneth to, to allow me to round up this time. <laughs> <laughs> There's the festive spirit in action. Indeed, indeed. I had to feed him a lot of jingle bells to make him do it. <laughs> so we've given it 82, please, Shields. I found one reference to it in print media which was the wall street journal reviewed by tom nolan on the 20th of december 1994 the gang at the 87th precinct hardly has time to wear out its welcome in ed mcbain's and all through the house a slipcase volume with illustrations by victor juhash this brief urban fable downbeat and upbeat at once is set at the famous east coast cop shop in the final hours of christmas eve its few pages pack a disproportionately effective and poignant holiday punch yeah that's basically what he says cool yep spot on i think i think that sort of suggestion of melancholy is something that does hang over a lot of christmas stuff as well doesn't yeah. it that so yeah i'm i think he would be awarding at least 82 police shields were he forced to <laughs> sounds like it <laughs> ring him up now and make him do it yep so there we are that is ed mcbain's and all through the house officially book 46 on our system of numbering so we've jumped ahead and that's our christmas special Mm -hmm. so uh, i'd like to say merry christmas to everyone again thank you for listening and sticking with us on this very bizarre year of doing all these remote podcasts which (laughs) is 
going on much longer than we ever expected. So, I know, yes. Uh, how many are we done now? Nine, nine, basically nine plus nine, eight. Everything since April, isn't it? Yeah, so, so maybe maybe eight. Yeah, crikey. Probably more to come in this format, but we'll see. <laughs> anyway, uh-huh. yeah. As long as everyone's looking after themselves and looking after each other and staying safe and doing whatever you need to do to keep you self happy at this time of year then you know well i just hope that's the case and so from us i am gonna say goodbye and merry christmas and steve-o i will say goodbye and merry christmas also merry christmas and morgan fare thee well and season's greetings ho ho ho